Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm glad all of you made it to this session. Hi, Uruj. Welcome to Design Boat and ADP group sessions. I'm Devki Nandini, and I'm a strategic experience designer, and I'll be hosting the session today. So let's uh, talk about the session that we're going to have today. So we as designers, our aim is to make people's lives easier with our designs, right? And we are slowly moving away from the concept of one size fits all in the past few years. Um, people have stood up for gender, racism, and caste in, uh, inclusivity, but it doesn't stop there, right? Like a good design and a very useful design is something that makes a difference in someone's life and has to be useful, inclusive, and accessible, not just useful. So that's our topic for today, um, accessibility in design. Um, Uruj Kohari is an independent UX consultant from Mumbai and has joined us today to shed light on what disability even means and the importance of introducing this concept into our design thinking process. So thanks for choosing to talk about this, Uruj. And we can't and wait can't to get the conversation the started. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Devkin. Uh, Devki. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish you guys good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are from, whichever time zone you're logging in from. It's wonderful to see all of you here, and it really shows a lot of passion on your end to be really connected with the topic of accessibility. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys are designers uh, who chose to really uh, take this up as one of the things uh, in your design. Uh, probably that's, that's my assumption and uh, we'll be definitely discussing this very, very important topic today. Um, so far, whenever, you know, design is being discussed, uh, generally the, the part of accessibility is more like a fly on the wall rather than the elephant in the room. And we really want to give it a center table, center seat uh, on the table or when we're really you know, talking about um, accessibility, uh, we are we're also including a lot many people than any other design that we already have. Uh, you know, it, it just not uh, makes the life easier for some people, it makes life easier for all of us. And hence, I think these discussions are very, very important. Uh, through the uh, session today, we will actually be going through some of the statistics. Uh, some of these statistics uh, really shock us, and some are really things that motivate us into, uh, you know, giving our heart and soul to really, uh, you know, do things for this cause. And uh, of course, uh, disability is something which is there. It it was always there. It was. It is going to be there. Uh, and at one point, even we are going to get old. And why not do things uh, for ourselves at least? Um, well, with uh, you know, with these thoughts, we'll just quickly jump into uh, a, way, uh, in a small discussion. Maybe uh, I'd like to uh, you know hear from you, um, two or three people max, uh, if you can. Uh, what do you understand from the concept of, or rather, the word accessibility? Maybe we can start building from there onwards. Uh, whoever speaking can unmute your mic and please go ahead. So basically, uh, accessibility, uh, in my understanding, is designing products that are accessible for uh, every kind of a person, regardless of age or maybe their racial backgrounds also, considering disabilities. Uh, this is what I understand because the accessibility term itself is so basic that it becomes a little hard to define it much more. This is what my understanding is as far as you. Okay, that's that's so nice of you to really you know take the lead on that. Thank you so much, uh, Ashut. Right? Uh, maybe we'll just have a yes. few more uh, suggestions. Thanks. Uh, we'll have a few more suggestions and then we'll proceed further on the on the topic for the day. Hi, uh, my name is Steve. Uh, my wife is disabled. She was in a really bad car accident when she was a teenager. 
Um, but I often hear from her, like Siri doesn't understand her when she's talking to the phone. Um, websites time out when she's trying to fill out forms. Um, lots of things we just do on, you know, using our phones and apps and such, we don't think about. Um, a lot of people can't do what we do. Um, and she really reminds me of these little things um, to us that are big things to her. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that, uh, but you know what, this is something which I think accessibility and disability strikes most of us at certain point in time in our lives. Uh, thanks, Steve, for sharing that story. Really appreciate it. And we'll definitely be building more on that uh, as the session progresses. Uh, thanks. And maybe one more uh, suggestion, uh, suggestion, and then we proceed further with the presentation. Uh, so I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? loud and clear. Yes. Ah, okay. ahead, uh, uh, in my opinion, accessibility means uh, making the design accessible for people with different abilities so that it can reach us to all of all of us, not just a certain number of people that we somehow sometimes we call them regular or normal people, which is a wrong term, but to every one of, one of us who has different kind of abilities. That's my opinion. All right. That's what I understand. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, so wonderful. I, I think uh, uh, we're pretty much on similar lines and uh, we'll proceed further into it, to dive a little deeper uh, into this and understand how, uh, you know, how we as designers should be able to, um, you know, create products which are more accessible to people with all sorts of disabilities. And there are definitely a lot of different types of disabilities. Uh, and often when we create uh, personas, we do not uh, you know, include uh, the the stories about these disabilities. So uh, I'll quickly share my screen and uh, proceed further from there. All right. So I believe my screen is uh, visible and we'll proceed further from here. As we move further, uh, a quick uh, look at the statistics. So from the year 2000 to 2022, the last 22 years, the internet usages increased at a staggering number, almost 1,355%. That's a huge number, okay? And we'll, we'll see how this really you know, ties into what we have been doing. Also the percentage of the world's population, which is using the internet, is at 66.2 percent. Most 5.25 billion people are on the internet. That's a huge number for everyone. Uh, it's a huge number for even the businesses out there. And businesses are basically the catalyst to uh, really uh, help us create these products. Otherwise, the funding won't happen. The world population today is almost 8 billion. That's a huge number eight followed by nine zeros. And, and that's, that's staggering, I would say. Unfortunately, the number of people with severe disability is also large. One billion people in the world today have some form of disability and, a vet, and you would say severe disability. Okay? That is almost 20% of the world population. We are looking at a huge number. Are we designing products for every one of them? Are we designing product for those 100% of the people? Or are we only designing products for 80% of the people while leaving out the rest? We'll have to just take a look at that. We'll have to scope it into what we are really doing. Number of people with a near or distance vision impairment is 2.2 billion who need some form of assistive technology, assistive uh, devices that will help them see properly. Uh, it's all, we would say these are maybe, you know, statistics that would shock us, but there's also a good news. And the good news is that the, there is an improvement by 15.6% of the number of errors, which you, you basically accessibility related error, errors, which were found in 1 million home pages. So there was a study done uh, on 1 million home pages. And we've seen that in the last one year, we found that the errors have actually dropped.
quite significantly, even if it is awesome. And that's going to really make our products really, really accessible. And what we're doing is with this thing, we're including everyone. And we're, we are hoping that all of us walk together and enjoy the internet, uh, you know, uh, or, or even get uh, educated or get quality uh, healthcare or just be entertained. So if we have all of these people come together, uh, it's going to be a wonderful place. And when we are building for accessibility, we are building for everybody, not just for one or two groups. Unfortunately, we should also be aware that if um, we continue uh, with creating non-accessible websites and products, there are lawsuits which people can file. And uh, different uh, countries have different uh, laws pertaining to accessibility. For instance, in UK, uh, a person who has, who's running a business, if they don't have accessible website, then they can potentially face a lawsuit from people who are trying to access it and are not able to uh, really use those websites. And go to US, go to Australia, go to other European uh, countries, there are different laws and these laws are really stringent as far as the web accessibility is concerned. And uh, we will actually be uh, seeing how all of these things really tie down to the kind of products that we make. We'll just quickly look at certain definitions uh, of uh, what is uh, generally uh, understood as uh, the, the definition for let's say disability. So a person with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the life activities. They, they actually want to do certain things, but because of their certain impairments that they have, uh, they're unable to uh, do things which otherwise they would have done. Now we have something on our screen where we can actually see how some of the disabled people are using their tablets and computers using a mouth stick and we, uh, we look at it and we say how much time they would be needing to really, uh, you know, input uh, the details into a form. And we have so many forms out there on the internet, which are like a kilometer long form. How would they be able to fill it? And then the worst part is you have something like a pop-up coming up and saying, please fill this up or this is going to go away in the next 15 seconds. And all the hard work that they have put in gets lost. Now, are we, are we going to really create such products? And are we not having empathy for people who are going to use such products? And today, this talk really stirs the, the honestness in that way, you know, where we actually should be looking at these things very, you know, in a very close up way. We are looking, uh, we're trying to ensure that we understand the situation and, and do something about it. And it's not that we don't have a chance, of course we do. Uh, it's just that we need to uh, ensure that uh, we give our heart and soul uh, as designers to making sure that we are able to create such inclusive products that uh, everybody uh, is cordially invited to really use those products and be able to you know, use it in, in a way that they, it also makes them happy. So uh, very quickly, because uh, we'll be looking at web accessibility as the, the main theme in today's session. So what is web accessibility? Basically it's the design of digital products so as to be usable by people with disabilities. As, it's a very, very simple and straightforward definition of what web accessibility is, right? And what is an accessible product? So basically a product that uh, allows both direct access. Now, this is very, very important. The keyword here is direct access. Uh, we want people to access these products without using any external means, any assistive technology. If that is, that is done and that is built into the design, awesome. Okay, we've really cracked it. If we can't, at least provide an indirect access so that people with their assistive technology, assistive devices are able to access these products and be able to do their work. Because everybody comes onto the internet to do some work. And if they are not able to do the work and, mm -hmm. and the whole experience is not barrier-free, 
then there's no point really in uh, creating the, the the best product and getting awards for it while we are leaving behind 20% of the people and and those people who actually need these products more than us at times so i'm just calling upon everyone to really think about these things ponder about it as to what can we do to ensure that we alleviate these uh, you know issues that they uh, they generally have and and we have seen uh, you know research after research that people who do need uh, uh, you know or who who are disabled in some way or form they no, do need these products a lot so we'll just quickly go through the types of disabilities that we are aware of and the first thing is now I, i'll actually be uh, uh, you know letting you guys uh, interact with me on that uh, you have your chat windows open uh, here's a question for all of us on on the uh, extreme left we have elizabeth if you think that elizabeth is a disabled person then uh, send a y if you think she's not send an n it's a 100% yes from the audience great if you think amy is disabled then press y if not press n awesome just two no's now okay. yes yes no, no. we'll come to that okay what about you yeah so like 50% no right yeah. cool um okay so someone saying temporary yeah awesome okay so the responses are coming so i'll wait for a few seconds great yep so some are still saying no and some are saying yes awesome let's move on to kati thanks so much for your responses kati yes or no y or n again people are saying it's situational right so um shell is saying we cannot tell by looking michel is saying michel is actually given the entire uh, you know let's say the entire definition of that but yeah we'll we'll uh, for the sake of everyone we'll definitely go through this whole thing so thanks so much uh, everyone uh, for taking part in this uh, we'll proceed further and some of you were right okay so we have the type of disabilities here which one is permanent the other one is temporary and the third one is situational and in all of these cases we do need the app or the website or whatever we are holding uh, in our hands to do certain work or we wish to kind of use those to do a certain work we need to be building for these use cases because at this point in time even kt will need some sort of assistance maybe she'll need to have like a you know text to speech mm. sort of a thing or uh, sorry uh, speech to text sort of a uh, input uh you know because both her hands are tied up with whatever she's holding in her hands okay amy would need it for some time and maybe later she may not and elizabeth might need it for a long time right so uh, we have we have to actually look at these that some point in time we will be uh, behaving more like a a disabled person and we will be needing it uh, and at a certain point in time in future when we become old we'll probably be needing these uh, you know as accessibility thing a lot more than we are able to uh, you know use now so we'll quickly just go through uh, some of the things here uh, and we'll see a uh, few of you have already um, given the details about it uh, we'll just see uh, generally we, we have uh, these senses such as touch hear you know seeing and basically speaking so when we're talking about touch you have one arm let's say somebody's 
who's not having an arm, they've lost his arm, whatever, uh, you know, in a war or in an accident or something like that. Uh, they, are perman- they are having a permanent disability. Well, whereas somebody who's having an arm uh, in a caste, they, they, are, they are having temporary disability. And a new parent, maybe she's, her hands are basically, uh, you know, busy holding the child. So, so you have these disabilities where you, they cannot use it. Let's say they want to go to um, uh, a particular, uh, you know, maybe they want to use uh, ATM and they're having one of one one of these guys are having a bag in their hand and the other arm is not there, right? Uh, they will not be able to use it. And same thing for touch or for here, uh, excuse me. Uh, so somebody is permanently deaf uh, or somebody has got an ear infection or a bartender is standing in a place where there's a huge amount of noise and they're not able to hear it properly. So what, what sort of a device would they be using? What sort of assistive technology they'd be using? Or uh, what is it that the product should have that would allow them to really pay attention to what the other person is talking? So at certain point in time, you know, even when we're talking about situational disability, uh, we will need uh, accessible products. So let's look at uh, the categories of permanent dis- disability. Uh, we have Im- vision impairment. Some people are compl- uh, almost blind. They are not able to see. Some people are able to only see light. They are not able to see anything beyond that. Some people can see only uh, blurry vision, hardly anything. And uh, as we proceed further, we will also be demonstrating certain things. So please hold on to it. Uh, uh, there'll be certain things we will experience how uh, people with vision impairment really goes through their day-to-day life. Uh, some people are color blind. Uh, they are not able to differentiate between red and green or, uh, you know, blue and yellow or, you know, several other colors. So there is like color confusion, right? Um, some people, which is very, very rare, uh, achromatopsia, that people cannot see color at all. They don't have the cone cells. They only have the rod cells. Uh, they can only perceive light and everything is monochromatic for them. So we have these cases uh, on, on the visual. Then we have auditory who are hard of hearing or any other type of diseases that would have, that would impair them to understand what's going on uh, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, from the auditory perspective. Then we have people with uh, motor disability, uh, dexterity issues. People have, uh, uh, you would say, are, are unable to hold even a spoon, let alone type certain things. So how do we cater to that, um, basically, um, those use cases? Uh, then we have cognitive. Uh, we, are, uh, we are aware of uh, people who's got um, autism, dyslexia, HD, ADHD, and so on and so forth. In fact, even uh, you know, combining it with other uh, diseases such as uh, uh, those uh, that require uh, people to remember things. People are not able to remember a lot of things. They, they quickly forget. They have very short-term memory, okay? Maybe due to uh, dementia, say, or, or any such thing. Or they have cerebral palsy. So we have to really look forward to all of these conditions when we are uh, designing things which have to be accessible to everyone. Now, we'll just quickly go through some of the guidelines. So. Uh, while uh, some of you maybe may have heard about this, uh, uh, I'll just try to clarify certain things. Uh, there is something called as universal design, and there's something called as these, you know, web accessibility guidelines. So these are the basically the guidelines. So some people have these th- thoughts in their mind as to how is it different, right? What is usable? Uh, what is universal design, and why do we need accessibility guidelines if that's already there? Uh, so just to kind of differentiate this, and as per my understanding, uh, basically universal design is the mindset, is the design philosophy that when you're trying to create a product or a service, ensure that everybody is invited barrier-free, uh, you know, any gender, any race, any form of disability, anything, uh, everybody's included and you're making the most inclusive product from the design stage, uh, those people will have the seat at the table who, who would definitely be, uh, you know, uh, otherwise be let, uh, left out. 
So you basically go ahead, uh, you know, do your research and come back and make these things inclusive for everyone. Okay. And when we're talking about accessibility guideline, uh, we're not talking about something which is um, a design. philosophy per se it's guidelines we tell the it's success criteria if you meet those success criteria you are on to a good start all right so these are the guidelines which actually helps you to create uh, products which are which are accessible to most people and if not you probably also can face lawsuits in certain countries uh, all right so that was the basically a quick uh, differentiation and with that we'll proceed further on the guidelines part Okay, so we have heard about uh, VCAG and we that's basically the full form is like web content accessibility guideline and we'll see uh, basically at 2.1, what is it that we have? Okay, so we have even uh, VCAG uh, 3 is being drafted and there's a lot of uh, debate that is currently happening, but 2.1 is definitely, uh, you know, out and people have been using it for the last several years. So what are the what are the four basic principles of accessibility which is promoted by WCAG? A um Uruj, you've actually gone on mute. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, uh, did I okay? Uh, did you guys not hear what I said to, or where did I leave you guys out? That just was accidentally last, maybe last you just started i think with okay. okay i'm so sorry for that uh, so yeah uh, the four principles of accessibility and the acronym is for um it, which stands for perceivable operable understandable and robust so when we're talking about perceivable the information and user enter the ui component mm. must be presentable to users in a way they can perceive it if they cannot perceive it, it just fails on the perceivable test. Okay? Operable, when we have the, user, uh, the UI components um, and the entire navigation, obviously, uh, if we are unable to use it, or not just us, obviously, uh, everyone, uh, especially the disabled people, with or without the uh, tools uh, or assistive tools, then that's uh, an issue. Uh, it will fail if, uh, we, we don't uh, design that to be operable. Then understandable. So information, the operation of the user interface is something that people understand. We talk about the language, we talk about the, the sentence construct, the words that we use, all of these uh, things should be understandable. So people should be under, uh, able to understand in whatever language it is being presented. Okay? Then we are talking about it being robust. And uh, basically when we're talking about robust, we should be able to, have um, the content and everything in the website or the app, uh, which is what can be also extended to other application. We, we should be able to create it in such a way that screen readers or, or any such uh, devices, assistive devices should be able to use it uh, without uh, really worrying about, uh, you know, what is being lost in translation, whatever. And uh, to do that, generally, what is recommended by W3C is um, you should be using semantic HTML. You should be using valid HTML. You should be creating websites with uh, the kind of HTML which is easy to render. Okay, so those things uh, are part of uh, robust. Uh, now, what we'll do is we'll take a, a, a quick look on something which is a part of uh, you know perceivable and when we're talking about that we'll we'll see uh, we'll just go to individual items within the guidelines which is uh, say 1.1 under perceivable text alternatives so we have to provide text alternatives why do we need that we need text alternatives for non text content such as images for example uh, if you don't have that then the screen reader for example will not be able to read it out Okay. It's just an image out there and a blind person will not know what the image is all about. So you need the alt text available, uh, you know, and that's, that's such an important thing. Then we have time-based media, videos, animated GIFs, all of these things. 
we have to provide alternatives. How we can do that is by providing some sort of a transcript for the video, or if it's a live video, or uh, we could even have uh, closed captioning, okay? That way people are able to understand. Also, we go further and provide the context in which everything is happening. It's not just the dialogue, but also the context. What is happening in the background? So blind people can now start visualizing how, what is there in the video, okay? Uh, then we go to 1.3, which is adaptable. Uh, we have to create content that can be presented in different ways uh, without losing information or structure. For example, we could have content as part of a table. Now, how would somebody uh, using a screen reader understand a table okay, or understand an infographic? So we'll have to create it in such a way that these uh, are presented in, in a way that uh, uh, screen readers are able to use it. Also, not just that, uh, what about the, the layout of the screen? Uh, if it's a mobile phone, okay, it could be portrait, it could be landscape. What happens when, when the, the layout changes? Will the content get disturbed? Okay. Uh, so all those kind of things we have to remember while creating the, uh, or while having perceivable as, as, uh, as the guide, as the principle. Then we have 1.4, which is distinguishable make it easier for users to see and hear the content, okay? And we have to separate it from the foreground and the background. And that's that's basically the case where we are talking about creating a context under which the action is taking place. So if we can uh, kind of communicate that context and the action, then people are able to use it. Uh, people are able to understand what's happening, especially those who are not able to see it. Also, uh, if you just uh, kind of try and uh, just ensure that this is understood in a very layman language and how do we really implement it and what the uh, success criteria should be, uh, that is nothing but ensuring that the visually impaired users must be able to receive information via even sound or touch or haptic feedback. You all uh, know about those things, right? or people with he uh, who are of hearing, uh, you know, people don't have, uh, uh, people don't, uh, are, are not able to hear, uh, you know, they are able to receive information through different ways, such as audio to text. Now, uh, what happens is that, and we've actually seen it in the past where um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loud environment, for example, uh, and we, we are still not able to hear some of, let's say the video is, playing and we are not able to hear that uh, even even if we put our earphones noise cancelling earphones on and all of that sometimes it happens uh, how about having audio to text conversion uh, that would also help the uh, the uh, you know able person to also take advantage of that uh, not just the people with um, hearing uh, impaired impairment then we have low vision users who will be able to receive information uh, with different ways of formatting. And we have also seen that there are screen uh, magnifiers, even at the native level in you know, Windows and Mac and other, place, uh, other OSs, where you will be able to zoom in uh, and create uh, larger uh, font sizes, et cetera. Uh, then coming uh, to the final part uh, where we have to understand the color deficient users uh, should be able to receive information uh, even if there is no color. For example, uh, let's imagine that uh, you have uh, a navigation bar and behind the navigation bar, you have added some sort of uh, image, okay? And what happens if uh, a, a, for some reason, the CSS doesn't get rendered? What will happen is there will be uh, an issue because most likely if the, if, if the image that you put in uh, in the CSS as a background was dark, let's say for instance, uh, and the text on top of that was say light, but now the image is not rendered. So you'll not be able to see it. Okay? Uh, especially true for those people where the internet, or the bandwidth is very, very low. By the time that image gets loaded, the page is already loaded. Uh, the text is there and you cannot read it, you cannot see it. 
and at times people will just exit from it. So we don't want those situations. So that was all for perceivable. Okay. Uh, now we'll move on to the next part, which is operable. So we are taking a very closer look at all of the things uh, which are very, very important. Uh, in the operable part, we have to make everything accessible by keyboard. What if, uh, the, let, let's say somebody's got an issue with their hand, dexterity issues, okay? Uh, so you have people who are unable to uh, keep their hands static or stable. So, uh, so how would they be able to use it? How about using uh, the whole thing, the whole web through keyboard? Okay, people with, especially people with uh, uh, vision impairment, they use keyboard a lot. Okay? And we have to make it for keyboard, uh, keyboard. Enough time. We have seen uh, one case where people were using mouth stick to enter information. They will need a lot of time to enter information. And if we have uh, sign outs happening or uh, pages are getting expired very quickly, that's not going to really help them because they've already done a lot of hard work entering all the information that you had asked them for. And now at the end of it, this is getting expired. The page, the form is getting expired. That's not really good for them. So we have to research a lot and give them enough time to complete the task. Uh, then we're talking about seizures and physical reactions. Uh, so I think about 20 years back in Japan, uh, while watching television, I think about 700 to 900 kids had seizures. The reason was on the TV, there was some cartoon going on. And in that cartoon, there was some sort of flashing that had happened where the image, uh, like bright images, you know, in the background, uh, they were flashed for more than 10 times in one second which triggered seizures. And that is the case, that is probably the reason why uh, we have to be aware of these things. Uh, do not have such gifts or such things on your website, which can trigger seizures in some part of the user group. Okay. Then navigable. We have to provide ways to help users navigate able to uh, find content and determine where they are. So it is very, very important to ensure that they understand where they are, they are at this point in time. Otherwise, it just becomes very difficult for them to, uh, you know, really uh, map out where they are at this point in time. Like we go to malls and some of these malls are really big. We also uh, get lost in where we are at this point in time. Uh, and it is very, very important that uh, we understand uh, our physical location, where we are in relation to our environment. And the same thing happens for people, especially people who are blind, because they have to create a model uh, of where they are at this point in time. Their location has to be uh, understood very well by them. And they should have a way to go back. The breadcrumbs and everything should be designed in such a way that they should be able to go back from where they started. because. Uh, it helps in uh, really orienting them properly um, to, to, to the place where they started from so that they can go back to the home and come back um, to this page or some other page. Uh, but they will definitely go back to home uh, at one point in time. So we have to create those, uh, navig uh, those kind of navigation, which is going to help people. Uh, input modalities uh, will have to make it easier for people to operate the functionality through various inputs. Now, this is beyond keyboard. Now, what are the, what, what sort of inputs that we are talking about? Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, voice uh, based assistance where we are letting the voice, we, we're communicating with through voice and uh, the voice is actually uh, working as an input device for us. Uh, we can use uh, uh, devices such as, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, eye gaze devices uh, or eye tracking devices where we are able to uh, really use our eyes as input devices and, the, and, and how we move the gaze. Um, Toby and other people, uh, other companies, they've uh, created wonderful products around it. Okay, uh, we could use, uh, we've already seen, uh, you know, mouth sticks uh, and there's so many other such devices uh, for which 
uh, we should be uh, even even uh, for that matter uh, interactive braille uh, strips uh, even you should be able to use braille strips uh, uh, as input devices beyond keyboard uh, now very quickly we'll just sum it up um, we'll have to uh, look for uh, as success criteria uh, functions triggered uh, via mouse or gestures are also available via key keyboard so anybody who's uh, doing it for uh, the rest, we should also ensure that not just the keyboard, but all other uh, devices um, are to be considered. And we need to give users sufficient time. Uh, our content should not induce seizure, seizures. And uh, we have to also give mechanism to skip repetitive content. Uh, because some of the content nearly repetitive um, happens rarely, but there has to be a mechanism to skip that sort of content. Now, when we are talking about landmarks, we are also talking about uh, the you know, H tags, H1, H2, head tags, basically, H3 and all of that. So it helps the screen reader. Uh, and then you'll be, uh, as a, a person who's well-versed with uh, screen readers, will be able to quickly navigate if you have proper landmarks defined. then uh, we have to ensure that multiple paths are provided so that they're able to navigate back uh, to their websites. Uh, so this is such an important thing. All right, now moving on to the third one, which is understandable. Our website or an app, whatever we make or a blog or whatever it be, make the text content readable and understandable. Okay, uh, this is, uh, clearly straightforward. Uh, we have to make it predictable. Now, how do we make web pages appear and operate in predictable ways? Uh, this is a very important part, which we as designers should really come closer and understand. What is this? When we, when someone goes to a website, ask anybody else, whoever goes to a website, we expect that particular website to behave in a similar way as other websites. Okay. Because there is a mental model that this particular website behaves in a certain way. So we expect the same thing to happen on our website. So if you make something totally different, what we're doing is we're breaking that mental model. And this is a lot more true, true for people with disability, especially uh, people who are blind. Okay. Why not have the same template uh, you know, for even your website? It just makes easier. Learning curve is flattened. You, you're not really making people do hard work. They're already doing hard work anyway. Uh, let's not overburden them. Okay? Then uh, that really makes things uh, appear intuitive because that learning has already happened. We are not introducing any further learning. And that really makes it a lot more predictive. When we're talking about, uh, we have care if, if at all they read the mistakes, awesome. Or if our systems are designed in such a way that we are more accommodative of those mistakes and errors. Okay, if we help them, the users fix those errors. Okay, maybe by giving them predictive text or something like that. And we can ask them, is this what you meant? So on and so forth. So it just helps them uh, really, uh, you know, with the input assistance and, and, and a lot more truer for people with dexterity issues. Okay, so what is the success criteria and how do we implement that? Um, so we have to ensure that the site is free of unannounced pop-up windows. Now this is terrible, right? We have lots of these pop-up windows flashing everywhere, especially people who uh, cannot see uh, or have trouble with certain form of, or, or they have certain form of visual impairment. They get annoyed by this. They get frustrated by this. What happens when someone is frustrated? When What happens when somebody is angry? The cortisol gets released, which makes people stupid. Temporarily, obviously. Why? Because the brain, the, the blood actually gets drawn away from the brain into your body, into your limbs. And it's more of a fight and flight response in some way. Uh, so you don't want people who are uh, used, who are, you know, temporarily stupid to use your uh, you know, 
products. You want people to be empowered. You want people to have an awesome experience because when that happens, you have uh, serotonin getting released. We're happy. The users are happy. They are in that you know state where they love doing whatever they're doing. Their work is getting done. And we want to induce that happiness in there. And hence, uh, we should avoid all of these uh, you know, barriers to happiness, right? such as pop-up windows, which are not needed in, in some way. Okay, then we're talking about uh, separate submit and go buttons. Um, okay, so this is very important here. I'll quickly uh, you know, try to pause here. Uh, let's imagine that you have um, a blog, okay, a listing of the blog page, or rather uh, a blog list page. You have five blog articles and each of the article will say, uh, read more, read more, read more. So for a person who is disabled and using a screen reader, what will they hear? They'll hear read more, read more, read more. Instead of that, can we have uh, a way in which the screen reader can tell them that, you know, uh, read more about this or read more about that. So that's that's for the links, let's say, for the submit uh, button and all of that. Why can't we have uh, a, a way in which people are able to uh, really take a conscious decision of submitting it? Uh, because the moment you submit certain things, it just becomes very difficult to retrieve that thing back and then go back and do the other thing. So your undo thing, uh, you know, or, or recovering from the mistake becomes uh, very, very difficult, especially for people with disabilities. So we have to ensure that, uh, let them do their work and then take a decision whether or not they want to submit it at this point in time. Okay, let's not just go ahead and submit uh, with whatever is there. So that's very important. Navigation and labels have to be consistent because we don't want to confuse people and uh, mechanism must be there to detect errors. Uh, of course, certain scripts that you can use to ensure that the uh, errors are detected early on. And, uh, you know, we provide very, very clear instruction on how to fix those errors. And as we said, you know, we have to be more accommodative of it and try and avoid the errors in the first place. Okay. And then we are talking about the last part where we uh, are talking about language of text or subsection, which we need to identify very clearly. Okay. And then finally, we are moving to the last part, which is robust. So it's not empty here. It's just that there is only one part we have to remember uh, to do uh, on the robust part. We just have to maximize the compatibility with the current and future user agents, especially the, the browser user agents, okay? Or allow extension to assistive technologies. So we do have ways in which you could, um, you know, extend the, the, uh, the compatibility or uh, improve the uh, accessibility by using other forms such as ARIA, okay, or or other ways in which you, or, or even uh, as we mentioned, you know, semantic HTML. So all of these things we can use to ensure that this part is, you know, something that we can take care of. So we are using validated markups. So we are labeling the uh, the role of the interface components and all of that uh, to ensure that these things really work um, together to ensure we have a very uh, accessible output. Right. So um, very quickly, we'll just go through uh, some of the accessibility testing and debugging tools that we have at our disposal, and this is going to be really uh, interesting. Uh, we talked about uh, accessibility parts. So we talked about the, uh, you know, we talked about the principles, we talked about the guidelines. We also talked about the uh, you know, success criteria, but what about testing? How do we test it? Okay. So, so first thing that we have to rem remember uh, is that there are three levels of con conformance, which is A, which has to be like the bare minimum level of accessibility. Uh, in fact, some of the uh, states, they want uh, us to have double A level of uh, accessibility, especially for the government and large corporation websites, right? And of course, triple A is more like a, you would say, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult for people to have triple A uh, conformance. Uh, this is it's not not really easy, but at least people can aim for it. Uh, but finally, end up doing double A. Which 
you just have to be aware of that. I won't want to do dealing later. Uh, for now, just uh, let's have that um, you know, innovation. What is it, what are the objectives of usability testing? So number one, to serve people with disabilities. Now that's a noble, uh, you could say, uh, objective. Uh, then to abide by legislation, uh, accessibility legislation. We don't want to be caught up in, uh, you know, uh, these lawsuits and to avoid lawsuits, obviously. So both of these parts really go hand in hand. Uh, unless we avoid it, uh, we'll not have to worry about fighting these lawsuits. Cool. So uh, this is going to be interesting here. Uh, we have uh, several debugging tools or even testing tools. And the number one is Oracle, Color Oracle De Desktop App. And I'm going to really show you uh, a, a small demonstration of that. Uh, I don't know if uh, some of you guys have already uh, installed it, uh, if, if you are interested in the subject of accessibility, uh, then awesome. Otherwise, I'll definitely be taking you through that uh, now. Then uh, there is a no coffee vision simulator. How do uh, people with impaired vision see the world? And we'll be able to simulate that right here. Then we'll see, uh, then there's something called as a web developer browser extension, uh, which you can really uh, download. And that's going to help you with things like switching off the CSS, switching off the images, uh, all of these things. And seeing how this really appears for people with uh, low uh, bandwidths. Um, those countries who, which have very, very low bandwidth. How are they able to see this? Okay. Uh, then there is a fantastic, my favorite, wave extension. Now you need, I think anyone with the interest in accessibility must have this browser extension. Uh, what does this do is it help you, uh, you know, understand for each individual pages, what are the accessibility issues? So it will really pinpoint those accessibility issues for you. And this is actually a favorite for most people. Then you have the Axe Dev Tools, which is also web accessibility testing tool and a Chrome extension, of course. Uh, then uh, you also have to uh, remember that, and which, which is also very uh, famous, uh, which is NVDA screen reader. Okay, we also, there's some, there's one other, which is JAWS, but we'll also come to that later. Uh, for now, maybe we could just work with NVDA screen reader. And if we have time, maybe we can go through it. Otherwise, we'll just give it a skip and maybe you guys can take it further from where we have left. All right, so uh, very quickly, what I'll do is I'll just open up the Color Oracle Desktop app and we'll see um, basically how people uh, with certain forms of uh, visual impairment, especially color blindness, they see the world. Give me a second. Thanks for being patient. What I'll do is I'll quickly uh, do a quick search uh, for, uh, let's say, colored uh, pencils, let's say. Okay, and then we'll see how a blind person, or, or sorry, a person with uh, limited color vision actually are able to see the screen. So what I'll, I've already installed it on my system and I'll take you through that. So someone with a deuteronopia, how are they able to see the world? This is how they are able to see the world. Okay, much of the red is gone. They cannot see. Okay, what if I, what if I search for tomatoes? Okay, I'll just go to the images and see. Let's see how a person who's got deuteronopia, be able to see it. For them, all tomatoes look green. Okay. Uh, I don't think we're able to see, is it just me or we don't see the changes? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, were yeah. you not able to see the screen at all? I'm so yeah, sorry I mean, for that. I could see the screen, but I couldn't see. Uh... Changes. Oh, okay. Please let me know if you're able to see the screen. 
Yeah. Are you able to see see my screen? All the tomatoes mm -hmm. and everything. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what I'll do is I'll just try and uh, show, uh, try and simulate what a person with deuteron deuteronopia is able to see. Are you able to see the green tomatoes? Yeah. Now it works. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So that worked. Ah, great. Otherwise, I was worried if you guys will be able to see it or not. So this is how a person with deuteronopia, which uh, who has uh, a loss of uh, you know red bone cells, uh, they are able to see the world like this, right? And we just saw the pencils, uh, you know, colored pencils. Let's see uh, how they are able to see it. Do let me know if you guys are able to see the screen because sometimes. These mistakes happen. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So this is how they are able to see the world. Now let's just go back to other color uh, parts, which is protonopia. Now this is a very rare disease, but it is there. People are able to see uh, like this in a pro uh, who's got protonopia, and we'll see tritonopia, which is very very rare. And here we don't see any yellows or greens. Okay. So some of these cones are missing. And this is how they see the world. We'll also uh, go through uh, with grayscale. It's actually um, monochromatopsia or other trichromatopsia, whatever. So I just forgot some that. So uh, this is how they are able to see without color. Okay. Uh, no color at all. So they don't have any. Uh, cone cells present, or even if they have, uh, those are not activated. And these could be genetic uh, uh, issues or acquired issues. And this, this is pretty, uh, you know, uh, interesting to see that uh, we all appreciate the world. Uh, we all appreciate the colors around the world, and we really are grateful when I look into it and how some of these people are not able to really enjoy the world around themselves. Uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, we'll see other parts, which is no coffee vision simulator, which is also brow extension. So if I were to come back to this and look at this, which is no coffee, and let's see uh, what is how, how people with uh, macular uh, degeneration would see. I believe you're able to see my screen. Yes. Yes. So this is how someone with a macular degeneration sees the screen. Someone with glaucoma is able to see the screen. It's more like a tunnel vision. Okay. Then we have someone with retinal detachment. This is how they're able to see the screen. Much of it is gone on the left, on the peripheral areas. Chemianu. And then people who have diabetic retinopathy, people especially with diabetics, they, uh, they have this, uh, and that's, that's how they are able to see the screen. Uh, many people you know, can see floaters. Uh, now maybe this is something that uh, is not very clearly evident here, but maybe on uh, pure white, people will be able to see floaters. And so these are the things uh, people are able to see. Also, this is, uh, or able to give you, this particular tool is also able to mimic or simulate uh, things like protonopia, deuteronopia and others, right? Or even deuteronomaly, tongue twister, where there's a confusion between certain colors, okay? So you have certain colors which cannot be seen and then certain colors where you have confusion in, okay? And so you can use these tools to mimic how your website or app will appear uh, to other people. So, cool. so that was it. Uh, so I'll just reset everything. And uh, we, we talked about uh, the, the other part, which is uh, Wave. I don't want to get into web developer or we can actually, uh, let me quickly get through that. Uh, we'll open one of the websites um, and then check uh, how this works. Let's go to Medium. So we have medium here and we'll see uh, how this works when we switch off certain things. So web developer is a tool 
uh, which is a browser extension, which is able to help us with our accessibility testing. And let's just check it out how it does. So let's imagine that um, we have, excuse me, um, okay, we don't want images to be seen. So we, what we do is we hide all the images and then see how it's, how we are able to see it. There are no images here. Or if we want to, you know, display only the alt attributes and hide images, let's see what happens. Okay. So you can actually see what it's saying. So that way we can test it out. Uh, let's imagine we don't want to see the CSS at all. This is how it's going to really yeah. appear. Okay. Well, somebody's microphone is on. Can you please mute yourself? Thank you. All right. So, um, so great. So, what we thanks so much uh, for that. I, I was actually having a little competition. <laughs> so, uh, so this is how you can use, and you'll be able to really uh, do a bit of troubleshooting of the website that you create. Um, so, this is a very in interesting tool. Okay. Uh, we'll just check uh, if we have. Maybe we just go back to the, you know. Reset it. Uh, all right. So uh, I wanted to actually show you what Wave can do, and this is my favorite. So we'll go to Medium and do the Wave thing. Or let me just open up some thing here, like a in, in, like like a post, and then we see. Okay. I go to the Wave extension now. What is this, and how do how did I get it? So you just have to go to, uh, you know and just type wave browser extension. Actually, you could just quickly go to wave.webaim.org and you are able to uh, add it to your browser. So I'm using Firefox and you, you should be able to add it to your Firefox. And it's pretty straightforward. The installation is pretty straightforward. You should be able to do that. So what I have to do is very simple. Just click on wave and voila. You are able to quickly see everything, you know, it's like the X-ray of your website. You have 53 errors. You have 29 alerts that you need to pay attention to. Uh, you, you need to be able to see certain structural elements, right? So there's, there's a lot of information that you can need to see, and it's going to really help you fix these issues. Okay? You are able to see where the H2 is. You'd be able to see where the H1 is, all of the landmarks, okay? If you don't want to see the styles, you can actually switch off the styles immediately and you are able to see your screen, uh, your page, and you're able to quickly uh, do whatever modifications, make note of it, right? Uh, we can also see the extended part, which is the ARIA labels. So ARIA mm -hmm. helps uh, with, uh, you know, screen readers and everything. So it's, it's a pretty interesting to, uh, you know, system that you can add to your um, web website. You can also see the contrast, like for example, whether it is passing the AA test or passing the AAA test. Now, when we're talking about contrast, you should ensure that you are aiming it for more than four. This is 8.59, which is fantastic. So we have to be aiming at four, uh, but for larger text, for instance, you could even go up to three, that is okay. So the contrast between the foreground and the background color. So you can actually test it here itself. Uh, you'll be able to see the structure of the page, um, especially you have interest in uh, what we call as the landmarks, right? Uh, H1 tags as to how they're placed and everything. So you have the entire structure of the page lined up here. So you should be able to see it. Uh, so you just have fun with it. You'll be able to see all the errors. It will take you to those errors and you'll be able to actually check what those errors are. And all right. And if at all you want to see the code, it can take you to the code. If you want to see the reference of this particular guideline, you will be able to see the reference for that particular gu guideline. Uh, I don't want this to be a very extended session uh, because um, everybody's got to go back to their work. Uh, so, but you can definitely uh, download this and have fun with it. You can go and check it with uh, whichever uh, website that you want to. 
All right, so I won't go into other tools because uh, we might run out of time, uh, but uh, maybe you, you would have taken note of this and this is going to be really helpful. Um, so what I'll do is now I'll just uh, quickly uh, go back to the um, slideshow and we'll finish off a couple of screens which are left and uh, uh, then hopefully we can take certain questions. Uh, I believe my, my uh, screen is visible because uh, it's funny that sometimes I just talk and then screens are not visible. Yeah, we can not see it. Visible. Okay, thanks so much for confirming that. Yeah. All right, so uh, we'll just uh, glide through this. Uh, what, what is assistive technologies AT basically? Um, so number one, we need to be aware that uh, assistive technologies are nothing but products that allow a person with disability to integrate in the society and to do what they really need to do independently. This is such a important part, okay? And uh, assistive technologies really bring them independence, uh, not having to ask help for specific tasks to friends and families. They just want people with disability, just want independence. They don't want to be seen as a burden on the society, okay? Those are the things that we really need to be uh, able to understand and help them with, uh, by creating accessible products. Uh, and once we have empathy for them, we definitely will be able to create those products, right, for, and be advocate for, for accessibility. Um, let's just talk about one of the assistive technology. And you would be surprised that the glasses that we wear, post-it notes that we put up, those are also assistive technology. And we use these. On a day to day basis, most of very specific screen readers are the only assistive technologies. All right, so here we go. So we have two types, which is low tech, high tech. We'll not spend a lot of time on this uh, slide, but I just wanted to kind of bring it to your notice that everything from post-it notes to wheelchairs are all low, low tech. Um, and the ones uh, which are high tech are text to speech and right up to the point where we are talking about AI powered augmentative devices. Now, what is uh, what is that? You know, sounds a mouthful, but what is it? Basically uh, what this device does is it hears out what you are saying. If let's say there's a, there's a person who is unable to talk clearly Okay, so this device will hear it out and then it will make the speech clearer. Okay, so the output of this, the speech is be very, very clear to the person who's going to read it. They use AI uh, trained models uh, who have heard about these. Uh, let's imagine one thing which is uh, something which we have uh, already witnessed uh, in our lives. Um, there are these kids, you know, very small kids who just started talking most of the time, their mothers understand what the kids are saying, but not the other strangers, okay? What has happened is because the mothers have been conditioned to understand what they're trying to say. And the same thing happens here. Uh, the AI-powered augmentative devices, they, uh, they've been trained uh, just like mothers to understand the babies, uh, what they're trying to say. And here, the output is very, very clear. <laughs> so these are fantastic devices. And I'm glad, um, you know, science has really progressed in this space. Okay, some of the pictures of how people are using uh, assistive technologies uh, to uh, browse the web. These are the interactive braille scripts, which uh, strips which people use um, alongside your keyboards, uh, in-ear implant devices or even external devices. E essentially, devices that amplify the sound for people who are hard of hearing. Uh, gesture-based, uh, you know, gloves and other things. All right, so uh, I think we are at the fag end of this entire presentation. Let's do a quick recap. Um, so what we have to do is uh, performing, uh, you know, accessibility testing while we're performing accessibility testing. Uh, we have to ensure that we should provide keyword uh, shortcuts. Um, also have to remember that there'll be text to audio converters for which we have to really design. Um, screen magnifiers will be used by people. Uh, people might even use color blindness filters. You know, there are color, uh, there are certain glasses which are uh, which have color blindness filters to it, or certain uh, 
you could you could even include uh, you would say um, certain software that can provide color blindness filters at the software level so that's also possible um, then performing uh, you know accessibility testing while we're doing that we have to remember that for physical disability or motor issues we have to ensure that uh, people will use voice recognition physical keyboards again keyboard is coming up um, and that our uh, you know a website works with various assistive devices and we have to also ensure that we have well researched screen timeouts um, coming to the cognitive disability part which is something which we have to be aware of uh, we should have clear ui controls very very clearly laid out ui controls so that they are able to um, you know not get confused with it uh, simple and understandable menus because we have to ensure that these are very very simple uh, because we are talking about people with cognitive uh, disabilities ample usage of images as as it is said uh, an image um, uh, you know say uh, says a thousand words one image is worth a thousand words whatever then we have the minimal distraction uh, that we need to provide on the screen uh, we have to ensure that the focus is there on the most key element on the screen. All right, uh, talking about the hearing disability, uh, which is auditory, uh, we can provide vibration-based uh, alerts, uh, like even on mobile phone, we can set it to vibrator mode if need be. Then you uh, you can provide user manuals and sign languages so people can uh, you know use it uh, and make the best out of it. We could have flash alerts in mobile phones, uh, like for example, if the call is coming or, or notification has come, all of those. Okay, and of course, well-researched screen timeouts uh, are here, but uh, we could just remember to use those. Um, and I think this is like amongst the, the final uh, slides, one or two slides more and we are done. Uh, why do adopting accessible design makes business sense? Number one, those companies who will uh, really reap benefit out of this uh, will be the ones which pays a lot of attention creating accessible products. So 10 billion, 10 to 16 billion uh, dollars are on the table for anyone to really pick it up by performing or by creating uh, products which are accessible. Okay, that's so important. Then the global estimate of the disability market is nearly seven trillion dollars, so which is which is huge, and nobody wants to uh, you know ignore this market. Um, whether or not we want to create accessibility related things, at least we should be aware of the legislations. If we don't do that, we have to be aware that we may be pulled in uh, for some lawsuits. Okay. Uh, also, TechCrunch had a report where it says that making your product accessible adds an additional multitude of people to your potential market. Let's say if your market is just like, like $5 billion, now with addition of uh, one more group, user group, you're making the market $6 billion, which makes a lot of business sense. Okay. And finally, uh, we also see that uh, non compliance is about three times higher. Uh, so we have to be aware of these things. Uh, we do. We want to do business, right? We don't want to um, go and uh, spend our time in, uh, you know, following court cases and stuff. Okay. Also, this is the biggest. One billion people should not be left out. That's a big number, and we, as uh, responsible designers, should ensure that we are keeping the needs of the people all of us, everybody, uh, front and center. And we should not be designing for uh, all, for everybody. We should not be designing for disability. We should be designing with them. They should have the seat at the table. Okay, now having said that, uh, it is again our responsibility to make sure we convey the message to the other stakeholders and make the world a better place for everyone, all of us. Thanks so much for being patient. Any questions, I'll be happy to take. Thanks a lot, Uruj. This was extremely in-depth and I think you shed light on a lot of important topics and uh, you've given it right there. Everything is there. You just have to read it and imply, uh, use it into our designs every day. And I hope everybody does that. 
And having said that, this is your chance to ask questions. Please unmute and talk to Uruj directly. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Uruj. Hello. Nagraj. Go ahead. Yeah. Who wants to go ahead? So thanks, Uruj. So this uh, session has given a lot of insights about like what accessibility is and how we have to implement. So I have one question. So you uh, mentioned about the lawsuits, right? So is it only applicable on uh, a specific websites in the UK or US, or is it applicable for all the websites in the UK, US? And um, do we also have something in India? Do we have any lawsuit in India? Um, yeah, great question. Thanks so much for asking and being patient, patiently hearing the whole thing out. Um, so as far as the lawsuits are concerned, uh, especially when we're talking about these developed countries like UK, in UK, the law is very stringent in the sense that if you're running a business and your and your website, which is really, you know, showing all about your business and which is representing your business, if that website is inaccessible, people with disability are not able to access it. Uh, they can sue you, they can sue your business, right? So that's their for, for, I mean, when you're saying business, it's, it's everybody who's running a business, like all the organizations. Coming to US, uh, there are different, uh, uh, you know, modalities, there are different legislation and different, uh, you would say, states. So, uh, but then just remember that most of the organizations, such as government, such as large corporations, uh, they must have their websites uh, accessible, okay? Whether we're talking about A level, we're talking about double A level, or even triple A, but most people don't aim for triple A because it's extremely difficult to do. Uh, so whenever we see the government website, at least they should aim for double A, all right? So uh, talking about Australia, talking about Canada, so all of these countries, they do have developed uh, uh, you know, legislations and they talk in depth and most of these, they uh, do it till WCAG 2.0. Uh, we talked about 2.1 today, but they do it till 2.0. Uh, but other countries are also you know, running fast to try to ensure that 2.1 is also applicable, right? As far as the India uh, part is concerned, I have, I'm yet to uh, see any such accessibility related legislation uh, coming up. Maybe they're working on a draft. I have no idea on that. Uh, but yeah, at least for the developed countries, these are completely out in public. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, uh, you also spoke about these blocked uh, vision field, right? Uh, the central peripheral corner side. So how, how I mean, is it permanent, permanent or temporary? Or is it something curable? Yeah, so um, Nagraj, uh, I'll take that call very quickly. Uh, I'll take the questions sorry, very quickly. So some of these um, things that we talked about, okay, could be temporary, could be permanent. Now, totally depends on how much uh, of technology is available to cure those. Some of these visual imperatives are genetic, okay? People are born with it, right? Some are acquired over a period of time. Okay, and some of these ability, uh, some of these can also happen as part of some trauma, some uh, or as part of some accident. Okay, and uh, but then these diseases as such, they generally happen uh, over a period of time or they are genetic. As far as the glaucoma is concerned, uh, that can be even treated in like fifteen minutes. There are there are uh, you know such procedures which people are able to use and can treat it. Uh, very quickly. So science is really advanced in that space. Awesome. Thanks for answering that. And uh, do we also have any tools to uh, test the mobile applications? So now whatever to, whatever extensions you have shared, it's all on yeah. uh, web, right? So do we have any tools which we can... Absolutely. Do? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you can use uh, Espresso for Android uh, accessibility testing. Uh, and basically, uh, Espresso users can use their existing tests to run and validate the um, accessibility issues, uh, uh, you know, you can. And actually be using GTX lib uh, with these issues, right? Um, so, uh, but the best part today, uh, what people are doing with the apps is they're using uh, mobile, uh, they're ensuring that mobile accessibility is built in and they're doing it through automated testing, right? And there are tools like Perfecto and such, which people are using to ensure that even the mobile uh, apps are uh, 
conforming to certain accessibility guidelines. Hope that helps. And we'll take another uh, question awesome. then. Thank you so Thanks. much. No, I'll, I'll, I'll let you ask the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. So, it's been, can I go ahead? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. Ashut, right? Uh, maybe you can yes. go ahead. Yes, Aditya after that. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah. Hi, Uruj. I just uh, want to ask a slightly Hi. off the context question. Uh, like uh, we are uh, like in I'm a scared. very nascent, <laughs> like we are in a very nascent stage of researching on and developing a digital product for people with special needs, kids from K to L. So when when we are designing such kind of a digital product, so like whichever are existing in the market, so when we are designing such product. Do we need to take care of all the disabilities, or they cater to special kind of disabilities, like uh, you know, uh, some kind of special? How do they bucket? Right. So I think that I think uh, it's not out of the uh, topic. Basically, it's on the topic, uh, but it's a very very specific use case that you're talking about. See, when we are designing something which is to be used by a larger audience, right? Then we should include everybody in it. But if you're very, very certain that this very specific audience is what is going to be using it, uh, and you're 100% certain that nobody else will be a part of that user group, then you can actually uh, cater to that specific user group. That is totally uh, okay because, uh, for instance, uh, how would you explain uh, creating only screen recorders, uh, screen uh, uh, you know uh, readers? Uh, very specific to or, uh, audience actually uses that. Uh, so when we're talking about very specific use cases, and uh, you have your basic uh, manifesto for that uh, project to be used by one section of the society, then you don't really have to worry too much about it. When we're talking about lawsuits and other things and, and the accessibility for all and all that. So we're talking about basically websites and apps in the general domain, in the public domain, and not very, very specifically catered to a niche audience, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So like we, we are like researching on the students uh, which are having disabilities. Uh, and working on creating a digital educational product for them. So like mm -hmm. e existing product, which we have seen are usually kind of, you know, which are catering to some kind of counseling program uh, for specifically for parents, or they are trying to create a technology product, which can help them do one particular task. But kind of what challenges I want to ask, like when we create such kind of a product, we need to take care uh, when we are designing such kind of educational product for them. So when we when you to ask, uh, thanks for that. Uh, when you talked about disability, again, disability is a huge spectrum that we're talking about. What kind of disability, right? Uh, that is important to understand. I mean, is it is it uh, uh, visual? Is it auditory? Is it uh, you know, related to motor, uh, is it related to cognitive? We have to be aware of these things. If you're seeing all of them, then you better go with uh, universal design, right? Where you are ensuring that every single use case is met. Um, but if you're saying that only we're doing it for visually impaired, then you don't have to worry too much about the other use cases. Uh, of course, the more you add, the better, but that's also increasing the complexity, time to the market, et cetera. So uh, I think my answer would be, it depends. Uh, it depends on what exactly you're trying to do and what the objective of that particular project is and who the uh, you know target audience is, right? So it's a very specific use case and uh, probably this may not be the uh, you know uh, audience or this may not really be the, the platform where we could take this very specific uh, use case and talk about it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Aditya. Um, Kailas, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks, Devki. Uh, thanks, Suruj, for uh, such insightful You're session. Welcome. So my question is around uh, uh, the kind of work you have done. or uh, Can you name some of the products you worked on and uh, which has a, a, a very good accessibility? some products or websites you worked on? 
Okay, so um, what I've actually worked on was uh, uh, not very recent, uh, but I've we've worked on IPTV, and one of the things that we have done for that was uh, the the remote control uh, that we actually wanted was something that that should be accessible by people without uh, you know normal vision, right? And if they'd be able to use it with their fingers, especially tactile uh, in a way where they're able to use their fingers to really navigate in a way that even uh, in a way that you don't have to really be a, a, a person with normal vision to it. Um, but of course, you'll wonder what will you do as a, uh, you know, how would you watch TV uh, while you are uh, accessing? But that was not really the case. Uh, you could even hear what was uh, going on the TV. Okay, so that was the thing. And um, I, I don't think uh, this, uh, there's a lot we've done because uh, of the fact that today people are not ready to put in a lot of uh, funds into main, main uh, making sure that you, you have something which is highly accessible and all of that. Of course, you would end up doing projects which are uh, up to A or double A for, for large organizations. Uh, I typically uh, don't work for very, very large organizations. Um, I used to work before, but not now. Uh, but my interest in accessibility is growing. So I'm also learning just like you guys are, right? And uh, which, is, which is very important. And I think together, all of us uh, will be able to uh, really create a dent in this world by making things making life easier for people with disability, but including uh, them, their thoughts while we are designing projects. So it is the start, let's imagine, and let's take it further from here. Thanks, Suresh. Welcome, Kailash. Uh, shall, shall we take two more questions and then wrap the session? Do we have sure, time? sure, let's do that. Yep, let's do that. Um, Mohammed, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Sorry, if I'm not, please. Uh, it's, uh, it's all right. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, Uruj. And first of all, thanks for this amazing session. It was really helpful. Accessibility is something that I really... Yeah, th uh, thanks for that. And uh, accessibility is something that I really want to focus on. And I was wondering if you can point me to some direction how I can prepare myself to make all my designs accessible. So the tools you have provided are really great, but I was looking for some you know, structural way through which I can, from the beginning, make sure that I am meeting the accessible needs of at least, I know that I cannot meet all the needs as you have mentioned it, it increases the complexity, but how I can prepare myself so that it's accessible to most of the people. Thank you. Any online courses absolutely. or how I can prepare, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So we have ADP list, it's a brilliant platform. You can you can actually uh, you know connect with me uh, and we can, we can talk it out uh, someday, uh, okay, over a coffee. Um, that's totally open to you and uh, uh, very specifically I won't be able to uh, give you any directions at this point in time because we are really fighting with the time you know that's the competitor right now uh, but uh, surely anyone who wish to connect uh, can definitely connect uh, on ADP I'm very much here and I'll definitely uh, love to spend time with you talking not just about uh, accessibility but also usability in general right uh, so I think Let's let's meet once more, All right? That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Achyut, we can take your question. Hi, Rich. That was a very very Hello. informative session. I, actually, I'm really Thanks glad so to be here. Uh, Appreciate uh, this, actually, I just started my design course uh, two days ago, and this session has been. Uh, you know, parts of the session have been a little. Uh, too overloading for me because since I've just started, but I did have an idea about accessibility and uh, this was very, very helpful for me because this will set my foundation, uh, you know, going ahead. I can understand the gravity of it. So what I wanted to ask one thing is I wanted to ask uh, accessibility in design and equity in design are this the same thing are they synonymous or are they different and another question is since this has been very informational would we have this recording available i was just wanting to ask that for sure if we, you will we, be able uh, to hear yeah we post 
recording, I think, within one or two days, and it should be on YouTube on the ADP List uh, official channel. And we'll be Great. sharing it on our platforms as well, LinkedIn and Instagram. Look out for that. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cool. So uh, coming to the, uh, the question of yours, equity, right? Uh, so when we're talking about equity and when we're talking about equality, basically, we all know the difference. If, if we, some of us may not be knowing the differences, um, let's imagine you have uh, a match going on, you know, a baseball match going on. And uh, there is this, uh, you could say, a barrier behind which two people are standing. One is a short person and the other one is pretty tall, right? Uh, the, the tall person can see the match, but the short person cannot because uh, there is this barrier in front of him. So what happens is uh, he is provided with some sort of a support to stand on top of that and watch it. So what is happening is while, when, when we, while both of them had equal chance to watch the game, there was something preventing uh, the short person to watch the game. So what happened was when we are talking about equity, uh, we provided some support for that short person so that they are also able to participate in watching the match. So when we're talking about uh, design or equity in design, and then it directly transports me to the, the concept of universal design. When we're ensuring that everyone is invited, everyone is a part of accessing that design, everyone is a part of uh, using that design, enjoying that design. So we should, uh, irrespective of who uh, really comes here, we should ensure that they have a seat at the table, right? As important stakeholders. And that's what it all means about equity in design. Does that help? Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Awesome. So Utkarsh, do you think we can wrap up the session now? Yeah, looks like it. Awesome. So yet again, thanks for choosing this particular topic, Uruj. And I urge everyone to include accessibility testing as one of the core aspects of QA in all of your projects. And thanks everybody for attending. And like Uruj mentioned, you can book sessions on ADP list. And when we were having a conversation before as well, uh, Uruj mentioned that he takes um, calls even outside of his calendar. That's how dedicated he is to uh, growing this community and providing for all of us. Uh, so go ahead and book your sessions. And if you have any feedback, do reach out to me or Rutkarsh and we'll implement that in the coming sessions. So thanks a lot, everyone. And um, do check out the uh, demo classes that we have on Design Board if you're interested in this particular course. Um, it's on every Sunday and rest of it uh, you'll find on the website. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Uruj. Thank you so much. It was lovely.